Well, great to see you again, Kate. Um, so lovely to have you on the Buddhist Geeks podcast again. I know it's been a while. It's been, I guess it was 2013 that um, when you're at the Buddhist Geeks conference, we took that short talk that you gave and it became part of the podcast, of course. So yeah. it's been several years, I think, since we've had this kind of formal, like recorded kind of dialogue. So appreciate you making the time and space, especially with a young child at home. <laughs> totally. um, to come I, I, and talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was really looking forward to it all morning. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And um gosh, you've been through a lot of changes I've noticed in the last couple of years. So you you had a baby, you moved, the pandemic happened, you wrote a book. <laughs> um how has the last couple of years been for you? I'm just <laughs> are, how are you how are you still functioning? Is my question really. <laughs> Well, I feel like, you know, it's funny because like in my experience, things were actually moving so slowly. Um, and so I know like now it feels like, wow, there's a book and there's a baby and there, you know, um, but mm. I, I was working on the book for a really long time. Uh, and, mm. um, and when I say working, sometimes that meant actually writing. Sometimes that meant like um, cleaning my house or, you know, like crying in a cafe or (laughs) Um, so I was, I've been, I I should say more, I've been thinking about the book for a really long time. And, um, and uh, yeah, so over the past few years, there was a lot of learning for me around um, how, how to write, how to write a book. I think actually um, writing was one of my early loves. And at some point Mm. I thought, uh, because I became more interested in dance, well, I became interested in dance too. And I thought, um, for some reason that I could only study one art form. Like, I don't know where I got this mm. idea, but I was like, I really got to focus and I'm a dancer. I'm not a writer. And so I stopped. Um, although I won some awards for my writing and I really I had this amazing English teacher, sophomore year in high school, Mr. Lieberman, who um, mm. was just incredible. He set his, his classroom up with a bunch of couches and floor lamps. And he turned off the fluorescent lights and we could bring in coffee and we just mm. sit around and talk about books and write um, so anyway, I, I, I had this deep love of writing, this early love of writing, and then hadn't really invested any time or energy into it formally until mm. um, I decided to write a, a whole ass book. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, and I have it here in my hand: proof, proof, <laughs> proof of book, whole ass book, <laughs> radical friendship. <laughs> um, seven ways to love yourself and find your people in an unjust world. This is a beautiful book, too. By the way, mm. just respect for the design here. It's really, um, I can tell what I can kind of get the vibe of the book, just looking at it, which is really cool. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, get a feel for it. I so. think that's, I think that is what good design is. And I've noticed that I've know I've learned that that's a whole skill set in itself, you know, of being able to take, a a, a feeling and an idea and make it visible. Um, so I'm grateful. Yeah. For, yeah the folk, the, the good people at Shambhala pubs for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it was, I was really cool getting the book earlier this week and um, reading through the introduction. Um, it was it was awesome to see that in, in part this book was born, the seeds of this book were born at the Buddhist Geeks Conference that I mentioned. Yeah. And um, I was curious if you could just, maybe we could start there, you know, talking a little bit about the, the genesis of this and um, certainly would like to talk about um, just some of the things that are connect to that, you know, um, sharing at a, at a mostly white Buddhist geeks conference about race, you know, at a time where at least in our community, we were just starting to kind of open into that conversation and start to look, take, like take a hard look at, at the topic. Mm -hmm. Um, so that can't be an easy space to come into, I imagine. Um, but you did such an amazing job and it sounded like you were surprised a little, you wrote it in the introduction, you were surprised at how, at how folks responded to that. Like you, you were kind of concerned, maybe it was, you're going to get more of a negative backlash and there was maybe some more positive responses. Just curious if you could talk about how this book was born and um, anything you want to share around that. Yeah. Well, um, time traveling back to 2013. <laughs> <laughs> back to Boulder. <laughs> Back before climate change was ravaging everyone. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> or, we, you know, maybe it was doing more than we knew. Um, yes, that's true. Yeah. The, um, well, it was my first 
kind of conference and I was a pretty new Dharma teacher. Uh, I had mm-hmm. been, uh, you know, interested in the Dharma for a long time. I had kind of, I think within the maybe, I don't know, five or so years before that really entered into a more dedicated um, formal practice and had taken the teacher training at the interdependence project really just because I was teaching yoga in public schools in New York city and more and more principals were asking for, for meditation um, and mm-hmm. knew about all the, the, you know, the health benefits for, for young people. And, um, and so, you know, I was kind of winging it based on my own practice, but I wanted to, to learn how to teach. And then um, I found uh, one of the board members actually of the interdependence project saw the, um, I don't know if you guys said an RFP or what, what the, the call was, but was like, you should, you should do this Kate. And so um, I did, it was a, the first time I'd ever applied to, to speak at a conference. I probably would have mm. done it on my own. And, um, and then I was really surprised, <laughs> delighted to see that you all want me to come and give that talk. And um, yeah, I labored over that talk. I mean, I, I, um, it felt like such an incredible opportunity to talk to um, not only practitioners, but a whole bunch of leaders too, about the mm-hmm. possibility of using our mindfulness practices in a way that might be able to um, maybe even circumvent some of the disasters that we were seeing in terms of the, um, you know, the, the violence and the loss of life in the black community um, based on implicit bias, based on misperceptions, you know, mm-hmm. with respect to race and color and body, body shape and um, gender. And so, um, so yeah, I, I was wanting to do it. I was really nervous and um, I spent a lot of time preparing to not only just like give a smooth talk, but also try to find the right tone. Like, and this would have been something that had been, um, I think a theme throughout my teaching where I felt really called to talk about these um, it was social justice issues, racial justice in particular, but um, kind of issues around power and oppression more broadly and right. talk about them in a way that could be supported by um, a c- contemplative and spiritual practice and really feeling like those two things went well together. Like I would see um, I'd, at that point done a lot of, you know, diversity training and um, s- to the point where I was um, listening to the facilitators, but also watching the and tracking the community as they were learning. And I could see kind of the moment when people would kind of get flooded and, and, and frozen and kind of tap out, you know, mentally. Um, and it seemed like, yeah, in any training I saw, there were people that were able to like stay in it and really be in it the whole time. And there were people who were kind of like in and out. And there are some people who are just like totally checked out because what mm-hmm. we're talking about is, is totally traumatic, right? Like and the, the roots, you know, how we got here <laughs> as mm-hmm. a society um, was, um, you know, horrific and um, bloody and heart wrenching. And, uh, you know, the idea that we're still somehow perpetuating these systems that, doesn't seem like hardly anybody really wants anymore. Um, you know, it's hard stuff. And so my, mm. I, I did have, and still do have this deep belief that there's something really powerful about um, braiding in uh, contemplation and breath and movement and, mm. um, and a kind of willingness to hold the vision that liberation is possible even as we dive into these more um, complicated and just uh, heavy, heavy territories. And so Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of part part of what was my preparation is like how to um, at least even for myself, hold the vision of liberation. Um, As I looked out in the audience, you know, of people who are, yeah, mostly white to hold the, um, like respect for each person's basic goodness and capacity to, you know, awaken to our, you know, to, to their own conditioning, to um, what, what else might be possible uh, as, as I was delivering this kind of call to action. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was really surprised that people were into it. I thought, you know, (laughs) 
people don't like being called out necessarily. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it's a delicate thing. And somehow um, the conditions sure. were right that day. Uh, and I think that we were starting to be at a time politically. I mean, that, this was you know, not super long after um, Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. Uh, so it was, you know, one of, I think, what been several lightning rod moments for us collectively around, um, uh, do I mean lightning rod? I mean, like, moment of truth. Um, and where we can kind of see reality clearly. And, um, and so I think that it was that, I think it was me. I think it was everyone in the room. I think it was, you know, the other presenters that came before me too. Like it was such a good conference. Um, Mm. all in all, you know, I think people were using different, I mean, people were using song, people were using dance. There were all these different modalities that were happening. I thought it was really exciting. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's how the, um, that's how that went. And then because, I given that talk and because you podcasted it, uh, editor, uh, at a, at a publication house heard it and asked if I'd like to write a book. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's totally, <laughs> that's how it happened. She wasn't there. She'd heard the podcast. Uh huh. Oh, it's so interesting. Okay. That's neat. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Um, yeah, it's like one of those seeds of intention that sprouts into something. You just don't know when it's going to happen. Totally. There it is. Well, thanks for doing all the hard work. <laughs> Glad I could have been part of that. In a small yeah, way. no, thanks for yeah. putting me on. And and the yeah, I mean, I feel I I know that I work hard, and I also feel like really, really lucky and blessed because you know that happened to happen, and the person who you know was able to acquire books for this publisher happened to listen to it. And again, mm. I don't think I would have. Um, on my own volition wrote a book proposal and, and tried right. to get it published. But, um, right. It, it was given the invitation. I found that I did have something that was really important for me to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting as you describe that, I'm, I'm thinking back to some of our teachers, you know, who went to Asia and then they came back to start teaching when they were quite young. Yeah. And I, I can imagine in, in a way, because you're part of this generation of millennial teachers um, who we didn't go to Asia, obviously, or we didn't all go to Asia, have to go to Asia to get, to get access to some of these Buddhist teachings. But, uh, in a way, like we do live in such a different kind of world now in, con- connected through the internet. And also, as you say, all of these, um, social topics and issues that have been around for, I mean, for, from the beginning, like they're bubbling up into consciousness, you know, collective consciousness in, in a certain way right now, that's, I mean, one, one very difficult, but also two, it seems like there is a kind of liberating quality to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like these moments of truth, like really have, there really have been things that have shift, been shifting out and changing and transforming, even though I know it on like one level, it's like too, too little and too slow on another level. Like it's, 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 it's amazing to see some of the, the actual shifts and changes. So to me, it's like, in a way you're describing, um, like having something that really needs to be said and still being an, you know, a fairly new teacher and, you know, relatively young compared, you know, compared to a lot of folks that are publishing books, you know, been teaching for 40 years or whatever. Yeah. It's, it seems like you're in a kind of similar position as some of our teachers were who, you know, had to come here and like have some, had to say something, the timing was right. And they're, and they're still relatively early on in their, you know, in their careers as teachers and still young leaders, um, in a way. Oh, so, wow. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I never thought of myself that way, but, um, I think of you that way for sure. Yeah. You're an important <laughs> voice in this, you know, this new generation of teachers who are, um, br- bringing a different perspective to the table, I think. Mm, yeah. I, I appreciate that. And I do feel like I'm a part of a, um, that there is like a, a turning of the Dharma that's happening now. Um, yeah. and I, I paused before I said that, cause I was like, is this too grandiose? You know, is this, I mean, like, you know, we turning the great wheel of Dharma is a big deal, you know? Um, right, 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 right. Yes, yeah. that's true. And so I don't, you know, in term, I, that said, um, it's not that there's new Dharma, I think, but it's that what we're turning the Dharma towards feels new. Mm -hmm. How would you, how would you describe the newness of it or what, what do you notice is new? 
Well, I mean, really, really, everything's new. <laughs> I think like really recently it's, you know, that we, um, I taught retreats last year, all of which were online, facilitated online. I know that you all have been doing that for quite a while, um, but uh, I had never had. And um, the way that I came up in the Dharma was that um, there was a, you know, Insight Meditation Society was not too far from New York City. And um, I really needed to go someplace and be there. And um, uh, yeah, would go and sit for like increasingly long periods of time in this other environment, right? I would leave home and go right. um, to a place that was, you know, culturally um, and geographically super different than where I was living in Harlem, you know, and I would go, uh, you know, to rural Western Massachusetts um, and to <laughs> a very like sparse, decorated kind of neutral palette um at the time not so flavorful food you know like just like a whole <laughs> situation. they really came up in the, in the i have to say um the, the cooks have been working in the, the, the blandness of the food <laughs> was that, highlighted yeah i mean that was intentional actually there was a period of time where you know ams was doing a review about um you know, what were the barriers for folks, um, in, in coming and by folks, mm. I mean like younger people, non-white people, um, people from urban areas. And, uh, they found that, yeah, like people were having difficulty like digesting the food or just feeling like it was, you know, similar enough to what they had at home that was like nourishing for in their bodies. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's amazing. The kinds of things that can cool. walk them around. Walk them. So they, they changed. That's- that makes a lot of sense. That's something I would never consider really, yeah. you know, it's like, well, what's yeah, amazing about teaching these retreats at, at home is that people, people are always at home, already at home, you know? And so that, right. that um, the, I think interestingly for me, the, um, the amount of new, like going to an environment that was completely different from what I was used to was, um, beneficial for me in my practice at that time, you know, as a young person who didn't have a lot of responsibilities, who could go away that, you know, and, and the foreignness of it actually helped me kind of make a break from the, mm. my daily life in this really important way. Uh, mm. what I'm noticing about the online retreats now is they're accessible to people who, um, for many re- different reasons, it's not appropriate for them to leave home, right? They're caregivers, they're young mothers, they're elders, they have, you know, um, uh, like trauma, disability. And, and, and what I'm noticing too about teaching these retreats is that um, the level of like quote unquote spiritual emergency, like people freaking out basically on retreat is not as nearly as high as it is on residential. Um, yep. And so that that's new. <laughs> I think that idea that, um, that we can have a deep and meaningful and profound practice, um, even at home and that we trust Mm. the people who are on retreat to, um, create a container for themselves and to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be in it for the period of time that we're inviting. Like that's so new. Um, Yes. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I I mean, you know, better than I do probably the technology and the way that's shaped the, the Dharma, but the the apps are new. You know, when I first started practicing, I would, um, you know, read a, like I get a book on meditation and like read a couple lines and then close it and try to do it. And then like open it again. <laughs> it was just so like, you know, very clunky experience. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, and now, you got to have the CDs that you put into your CD player yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and most of the people I meet now who are beginning a practice began it through, you know, using a meditation app or some kind of online yes. platform. And so there's totally. like the, the form parts of it. And then I think um, in terms of the practices, Yeah, I just feel like it's what what we're applying it to is new, um, mm. and it, some of it has to do with uh, the social issues and the political issues that we talked about, and like yes. the willingness to include those um, the awareness of what's happening outside, so called outside the this, this mm. meditation space within within what we. apply the dharma lens to uh, yes is is wider is wider than it used to be and i think that there used to be 
I think an idea that if we were to, you know, within a meditation, um, within a guided meditation or within a meditation class or retreat, acknowledge the, in a specific way, the presence of, you know, um, a, a natural disaster that was driven really by the not so natural <laughs> forces, right. But is you know, created by, by human beings or, um, you know, a, a, a national tragedy, like a, um, a school shooting, you know, or something like that, that we would somehow disturb people's samadhi and they wouldn't be right. able to drop in. I think what we're finding now is that for some of us, we can't, we can't actually drop in until those things are acknowledged. Right. Um, right. And that somehow acknowledging the existence of, you know, racism or patriarchy or, you know, the, um, you know, man-made climate crisis, like that, allows folks to settle and to apply Mm. the dharma to the things that are really causing some of the most intense suffering in our lives you know that it's not actually suffering in the abstract but in in a really specific way and um yeah Mm. i love that Mm -hmm. (laughs) i I need that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no it it feels like what you're describing to me is um so much about making the dharma relevant to the times that we're in rather than trying to to have this thing that exists kind of just in the timeless mode where you leave the world and you go into like whatever, into Nirvana, into, into the sort of timeless Samadhi. And then it's like, Oh, okay. That's the solution, you know, just yeah. to get out of the samsaric existence and, you know, and, and experience personal liberation, you know, that that's um, somehow sufficient. Um, it doesn't seem like, seems like we've shifted almost in a way that the, it's like, like in early Buddhism, you had the arhat, you know, ideal, like mm-hmm. just wake up and then you have the bodhisattva ideal that emerges later. It's almost feels a little like that. Like we're going back through the same kind of turn in a way. Oh my gosh. I think that's really true. I think mm. that's really true. Yeah. It's like this real mm-hmm, deepening and expanding and like reemergence of the bodhisattva path and within this, tradition yeah and and i think in a, in a way that is like um increasingly actionable you know that um that uh not only are we expressing the you know, wish that all beings be liberated but we are also finding new ways to work for it mm. it's beautiful and you know the I think the description of like how the forms are changing, it's so tied to that, you know, cause you, you'd mentioned your experience, which was mine as well, where, you know, in the introduction of the book, you talk about going to IMS and going on retreat and how, you know, you really, even in urban centers and especially residential rural retreat centers, no one's really talking to each other much. I mean, there isn't even really space to have those conversations yeah. because you're kind of being asked for that period of time. And, and I think it's probably changing a lot, but at least when we were coming up in the, in the <laughs> Dharma, um, you know, it was, it was like, there wasn't even, there wasn't even space to form real friendships based on, you know, conversation and sh- shared, you know, just sharing stuff with each other. So, um, yeah, being online. So it's, it's different. It's a very different medium. And like you said, people can be at home and they can, bring the practice to their life rather than leave their life to go practice Mm. such a different orientation. And it's like, Mm. Oh yeah, like I'm at home and I'm aware of what's going on on the news. And I'm, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm touched into the world and I'm in the world and I'm practicing in the midst of it. It's like, Oh shit. To me, that's more advanced in a lot of ways. (laughs) It is. It's harder. I think so. Yeah. Um, And I think it's more, I think it is more, Mm. inclined towards a style of practice that, you know, many of the teachers that are very dear to me um, incline themselves more towards like a um, Thai forest style tradition. And they really come, you know, out of um, a lineage of Ajahn Chah who, you know, yes. kind of famously said like, in order to become enlightened, you need as much about as much samadhi as you need to read a book, you know, like that he is, wasn't like into the deep, deep, deep concentration states. I don't think you can, it has not been my experience so far that I can um, reach the same level of like, yes, I don't even want to say level, but it's a different, it's a different experience practicing, you know, 
and also reading the news and also taking care of my kid and also, um, you know, sweeping the floor in my own home, um, than it is going away somewhere else and having just a real kind of seclusion and simplicity. Um, and I don't think, I guess I'm still in the process of, gaining confidence in the possibility that one is not better than the other. Mm, 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 mm. You know, I, yeah. I think the idea that going away and having this like really, you know, profoundly concentrated state um, mm-hmm. from which I explore, you know, the, the, um, you know, minute by minute unfolding of my karma, you know, like is, is um, what I, what I learned first and what I learned was the most important thing. Um, and it is something that's such a rare opportunity for so many of us, you know, so many people can't ever do that. And then, you know, for those of us who can, maybe we can only do it for a period of time in our life, you know, and then, and then it goes in and out. Um, right. And, and so, then you have kids or your career yeah. starts heating up and you're like, I can't leave for three months to right, just go right. do this. And so like the, you know, I, I think, <laughs> as you know, you know, at the end of those residential retreats, we always have the, there's always this talk about um, taking the practice home, you know, right. and people are like, how do I take this home? Which is, I think maybe part of the question is like, how do I feel this way? How do I lock this feeling in? Which of course we know is not possible. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> you'll not be able to lock this in. Um, right. So right. I think there's also, you know, this idea of like um, in that question, one, how do I integrate practice into my daily life? But like, how do I, how do I, um, how do I continue to grow and deepen when I'm not on retreat? Yes. Um, And so the cool thing about you doing practice at home and having a life that is more integrated into, you know, the everyday world is that, um, you don't, you didn't go anywhere, you know, like this right. is, so you don't have to think right. about being the practice home. But I do think that this, there's, there is this like question for me about, or really it's like an exploration. It's a, like, how is it that I can continue to grow and deepen um, on this path, you know, as the mom of a seven month old kid with a partner and, you know, a noisy neighbor and, you know, a, plumbing issue you know what I mean? <laughs> yep flooded basement yeah, all those yeah. things <laughs> how, how can i you know and and i want to believe that's possible and i see you know yes like i think of deepa ma right right the, ho- to, the householder yogi yeah yeah i i am um, i feel like <laughs> of course i never got to meet her but um i feel like she's got some teachings for me yeah, that I, I I so much appreciated reading. Uh, it was Amy Schmidt's book about Deepa Ma and how, you know, she, people she would have students come over to her house when she thought they were kind of like at the precipice of a deep insight, and she'd say, "Come over to stay in the extra room and like come on retreat with me for a few days," you know. And she'd teach you know mothers who are breastfeeding how to bring mindfulness to the to the experience and use that as part of the path and things like that. And I was just like, "This is amazing! It's so radical to." you know, tr- tr- treating everything as the path. Oh my God. I haven't, I haven't read that book, but I think <laughs> I, I will now it's my next one. It's a sweet one. And uh, it's amazing how many powers that she, you know, like how the magical powers and some deep Samadhi was like such a part of her path, but, but she was also so like such a focus on integration and bringing things together. So yeah, it's pretty interesting how someone, one person could be like really into both. Um, Cause like you said, it feels that they're almost a little mutually exclusive to me, like all the time spent on retreat doing, you know, focusing on this like deep Samadhi by definition, that's what you're focused on. You're not focused on social issues and you're not focused on relationships. You're not focused on other things. It's, 
I mean, I know that's not the only kind of meditation that one can engage in on retreat, you know, just samadhi practice, but it's, it's the, it's the environment that supports that kind of meditation. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that the, how I got, ended up getting through some of those retreats was like switching to meta, you know, mm. ended up doing a lot of, yes. um, uh, because being, you know, I mean, I guess it's a, a similar situation to being, you know, te- giving a talk at an all white conference, like, you know, in those, those early retreat days, like I was often on, one of only like a handful, if that brown people on retreat. And I, I really could feel like how visibly I stuck out, you know, like mm. I, I, would, I feel like I need to be on time, you know, early at every single sitting because like this teacher could just scan the room and see whether I was there or not, you know, like a, a number mm. of hundred people. And, um, mm. and, um, because, you know, some of the things that I was, I think called to heal mm. through the practice of meditation were harms that had happened from like being the only one, you know, and the, the kind right. of um, feelings of isolation and not belonging and, you know, um, uh, hyper vigilance and kind of policing of my own self in those environments. Um, and so then mm. I just needed a lot of, a lot of meta and a lot of compassion to be, to be in those spaces. And as it turns out, you know, that, that was, um, I think, those are good doorways for me into, into a, a, a more concentrated state. Like I couldn't really mm. at some point kind of hit a wall and couldn't really um, continue to settle until I was you know, making an intentional practice to send love to myself and to really um, mm. draw, draw forth in my awareness, the goodness and all the people around me. Um, mm. Mm. Otherwise there was just too much yes. atmosphere and, and, right. and your judgment and yeah yeah so so it's like it helped you relax it sounds like it helped you relax yeah help me relax it helped me relax it helped me mm-hmm, relax and there and also to um the phrase that's coming to mind is to see the beauty hmm. like i remember one time being on retreat and um i was you know feel <laughs> I was like, why did I come here? You know, I was like there for two months. I was feeling totally like isolated and alienated and like a total weirdo, you know, <laughs> like, I, I, um, I was, my job was to chop, um, to prepare for lunch. And I was asked to like wash and chop some lettuce. And even then, like I wouldn't even see any of the cooks. Right. Like, so I was so lonely. I would just come in, they'd leave me a note and like a, a bag of lettuce and be like, wash this. I was like, okay. So I'm like <laughs> washing the bag of lettuce. And I just had this moment where I saw the lettuce and I was like, Oh my God, this is the most beautiful lettuce I ever seen. Like, and it was, mm. it was not a happy retreat for me. I was really suffering, um, really kind of just, I think purifying some stuff that was really hard. And, mm. but, um, then at some point reflecting on that experience, I realized that it wasn't that I, the lettuce was beautiful, but that my, I had a beautiful mind. Um, mm. And I really think that that was, um, yeah, directly related to having having brought up the volume on the meta practice at that time in the, the mm. to be able to see mm. the beauty. That's beautiful, literally. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're sharing your experience on retreat. Um, had me think about um, Spring Washam shared really similar uh, kind of reflections about her experience. Um, another um, woman of color teacher. And she, you know, she, I think at one point she said, she even said she couldn't be on retreat anymore given what was arising and that even meta practice wasn't, wasn't doing it for her. Like she needed to find something outside of that context to help mm-hmm. her work through some of the racial um, pain and wounding that was coming up in that space that didn't, you know, didn't really, in a way, wasn't really designed to support and serve that and almost the opposite. Right. Yeah. So good to hear that. I had heard that. It's so funny. I'm like, I I knew that that happened this spring. Like, and why did I still go to that? You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I think it just, it makes me laugh because I'm like, I, I always think that regardless of what someone else's experience is, mine's going to be different, you know, like, 
I'm going yeah. to nail this thing. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> and as it turns out, um, pretty much the same, <laughs> pretty much the same as spring with, you know, who had done the same thing, you know, decades earlier. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I, that may be something new too, in terms of, um, I know that there was in earlier moments in the Dharma entering in of, you know, Western psychology and psychotherapy. And so many of our teachers became, you know, psychotherapists and an right. effort to understand, you know, the, the, the setup of the Western mind and how it related to the uh, Buddhist psychology. Um, and I don't know if this is true, but the thoughts that's coming up for me is um, that there's a a new focus on healing, and I feel like maybe maybe part of that is that you know Western psychotherapy has evolved to un- with an understanding not only of the ways that our you know, early childhood experiences and family systems shape us, but also the way the societal forces shape us and the mm. um, way that that can manifest as a um, seemingly, you know, personal psychological issue, but that is really tied to this more kind of collective experience or even intergenerational experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I feel like the, that understanding of that frame and also the possibility that we could, that some of these practices could help heal and transform even those have system, the impacts of kind of systemic and generational trauma is, is, I was going to say it's new, but then I think about, um, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh and his mm. you know, understanding of the ways in which our, our moment to moment practice can, as I think about it, he, the way he talked about it, almost like a vector, like it can shoot forward into the future to our descendants and it can also shoot backward into the past and heal some of our ancestors. Mm. So he was taught, you know, nothing's new, but, <laughs> but, um, maybe, you know, certainly newer for me and feeling mm. particularly relevant. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you think it's fair to say like every generation has to rediscover some of these deep truths anew and then apply them in new, new scenarios, new situations, since everything keeps changing, like the culture, we don't, we don't grow up in a, anymore. Certainly we don't grow up in a culture that resembles the culture of our ancestors. Even right. it's changing so quick. Everything is changing so rapidly. Yeah. Maybe it was more time. Maybe it was like in the past, maybe it was less like that. We were dealing with less cultural change. Many people. Right. You know, I, I don't think know. That, that sounds, that does sound fair to say. I think that's a, a beautiful way to, to think about it. You know, that like each generation has to you know, gets this toolkit, has to learn how to apply it to the current conditions. And that it, I, what I like about that is that it feels like, it describes kind of how it feels to me, which is this like Mm. adventure or this quest, you know, it's like epic story of like, you know, how do we, and how do we move forward and how do we wake up and how do we be together now? Mm. Um, uh, Yeah. I like that idea a lot. And, and I do think, you know, when I think back to the conditions that were there when some of my, you know, teachers and teacher teachers were, um, coming back from Asia and teaching in the West for the first time that um, that maybe part of the generational task, you know, for that generation was to say like, you know, we can drop out and we don't have to participate and we don't have to, you know, kind of move along with the status quo and we can like um, re-envision what, what adulthood is and what family can be and you know like all of these kind of um there was such a pressure i think to conform you know um coming out of the you know the 50s and early 60s and so like that that like big rebellion and the um drop out tune out culture was was really important for that time and was really radical and maybe a real needed break from the from from what come before um but just like, but then that's not, that's not also not all the way to liberation. Right. And so, you know, then, then 
we have this other iteration and it reminds me of more, that more, more work to do, <laughs> more to do you know, yeah. another raft to, to pick up and another raft to, to, to leave behind, yes. you know, not to yes. strap it to our backs and carry it, you know, all fun. Yes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, I, I think in some ways for me, I feel like the, the raft that I picked up from the boomers was this sort of focus on in, my individual experience like this in the indiv- the raft of individualism mm-hmm. you know and you talk about that you write it you write about that in the book obviously um yeah i think our conversation is giving me a little more respect for that raft you know that like oh that the, the that that gesture of no i'm an individual and it's okay for me to want you know something for myself that's different than what you want for me and to be you know to to be unique and to be um, introspective and to uh, have an inner life that um, mm-hmm. is important mm-hmm. to cultivate like that. Oh. Right. Like independent of, of your, you know, family, family of origin or your, yeah. yeah, of your culture. Yeah. That is beautiful. I mean, and, and I mean, and to this, it, it gets complex, you know, talking about this because I know there's so much nuance. Um, but, you know, one of the things I do appreciate about, Western culture and about part of what we've inherited is the emphasis on individualism does seem to give birth also to like the first large scale democracies in the world. And the, and the sort of the emphasis on human rights is something that's like baked into, to the legal documents that, that these countries are founded on. Now, of course, the reality of it is so much like more messy and, uh, imperfect than that. And it's like not even in, you know, our democracies, like in the beginning, it's just, it applies to white men. Mm-hmm. That's what the freedom applies to. And then, you know, over time it starts to gradually include other groups and other types of people in like how we're defining like what a person is that de- deserves these rights. But the fact that that was born from the seed of individualism, you know, that I appreciate that so much that focus on like there's something about your personal experience that is important that we can't just like crush everyone's experience or expect everyone to conform to this particular way of being. Yeah. I, it does, you know, that does resonate that like in that, like the notion of like individual rights and human rights, like, um, and, and personhood when you're talking, it makes me, um, curious about also like, um, So another, it, it makes me curious about how, for example, like a democratic, I don't even know if you call it democratic, but the, the kinds of, um, you know, political processes among like indigenous people and first nations people and how that came to be. Um, I mean, I'm sure that they are different depending on like, you know, ethnic group and whatever. Um, but Mm. I think part of, I'm just, it it makes me curious about that. Like, like, is, is there a model for, and this is part of where like language is failing me, right? Like what was before, what was before that? And what did it, what, you know, what could it tell us about, um, Mm. Mm -hmm. the way forward now? Because I do think that like, you know, in, in, (laughs) In the yeah. way that, you know, there's so much that's new now. And there's also, I think, um, a real, I don't know, I feel, and, and I, I can see in my, like, friends and community, like, this desire to also know, like, what what came before, what we were taught is, like, the beginnings of our, you know, modern society. And, mm-hmm. um is there something there that has clues for us about how we might be able to um, be free yes. from some of the, um, the pitfalls that came with yeah. something like individualism? Oh gosh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, to make, to mean the, to kind of head more into the personal um, direction, I, I've been thinking about this a lot in the last several years as my grandparents have gotten older. They're in their late 80s now. And um, I grew up um, 
very close to them and they were um, farmers um, part, part of their part of their uh, their livelihood they always gardened and farmed had an orchard apple orchard things like that and it's only in the last several years that I've kind of felt this tug to like come back around to that and learn like learn how to grow my own food mm. and you know and to work with my grandparents like they've been my primary mentors in that respect and it just feels like this incredible process of retrieving the wisdom of the past uh at the same time like i i couldn't disagree with them stronger on political issues and you know and other topics it's like we're you know there's, there's certain things i'm not wanting to retrieve you know? <laughs> 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 but the, there are things that are so valuable and like they know how to live they, they 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 learn how to cook and eat and live in a world that wasn't like the fast food modern convenience right. world and and as a result like they're happier and healthier and like there's a lot of things i really want to like take from them and and and, and utilize in my own life uh, that are very much antidotes like you said to the pitfalls of of being in a modern age and my grandfather in particular he grew up in palestine and you know he grew up in extremely poor rural village um and when i hear descriptions of his life and like where he came from I, it's like hard to fathom it's just it's almost impossible to fathom um like how different of a of a way of life that is um yeah. so but I often wonder about it and think about it and be like, wow, this is such a, you know, in, in some ways, this is such a radically different world that I live in than he, than he grew up. In. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I feel you on that. There's like, what, what's the wisdom that we need to retrieve um, from the past and from our ancestors and, mm -hmm. you know. This, what was his path like? Like, did he, my, my dad's an immigrant too. And I know he, mm. he, uh, from Honduras, and, right? From Honduras, yeah. In mm. some ways, like, um, I think went the assimilation route. Like, just there's a sense of like, well, what we're here to do is really benefit from, you know, the the um, you know what modern American society offers us, and so um, you know we did that. And um, but you know there there's some things that I don't think he could he could get rid of if he tried or, you know, some things that, um, he didn't want to get rid of. Like he didn't even become a, a real, he didn't, um, gain his citizenship until like, I think it was a few years ago when, um, right before Trump took office, my stepmother threw a, a holy fit and like insisted that he get his citizenship because, um, he had a green card, but, um, mm. he didn't want to fully, um, he just wasn't, wasn't ready to give up his, you know, mm. his passport and his identity as a, as a Honduran citizen. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I guess, I don't know if there's any, well, I'm curious about your grandpa and like, mm. um, did he have the same kind of ambivalence around joining, not joining? I, I, th I think, you know, in his case, I think there was a lot uh, of assimilation, like you said, um, you know, he, I think because he didn't have anywhere he could go, he didn't have anywhere he could go back to, you know, in a way he lost his homeland when he left, uh -huh. um, because he left in 1948 during what's called the Nakba, you know, so he, he left essentially at gunpoint, you know, he and his family left, um, left their home. So you know, in a way he carried that wound with him and that really shaped, I think a lot, our family system. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah, he was this classic bootstrap immigrant story. Like I didn't know shit and I ended up being the valedictorian of my college. And then I, you know, he like, he had a very, very much a, con a path of conventional success that I think was largely driven by that wound. You know, it was like, the fear and the terror and the experience, like it drove him to be, to become like really productive and successful. Um, but like the impact of that is, you know, and the, and the ramifications of that were very real, yeah. um, you know, and so, yeah, I, I, I often think about the, the notion of internalized, you know, racism. And I feel like it, that, that idea does a lot, to help for me explain and understand some of the things 
It's like how can I, it's like how how can my Palestinian family members vote for Donald Trump? Mm-hmm. You know, like how do you like reconcile that? You know, and it's like the only way I know how to do it is like well, you know, when, when you're when there's enough fear and enough wounding, it's easy to get hijacked. You know, it's easy to to fall into certain ways of of thinking. And I remember being in my grandparents' living room couple like last year year two years ago before the pandemic and i i was just sharing some of my own frustrations about like um how we how we live in a in a in a society that is like constant like the tech the monitoring you know technology mm-hmm. monitoring and things like that and just how like in a way like fucked up it is you know <laughs> just kind of sharing that and and they the first reaction they were like shh you know like don't don't say these things out loud because because it's being monitored oh, wow. and it, and it was like that was a wake up call for me that like to see how they must be thinking about what they say out loud and like how they're policing as you said policing themselves mm-hmm. particularly my grandfather um uh, he you know he experienced a lot of prejudice uh, after 911 you know that that was mm-hmm. For me, that was a huge awakening to this, to these to-, to topics of you know that you talk about in in the book, um, particularly around race. It was just like, oh my gosh, just because of your skin color or, or where your your ethnicity, where you're from, it can put you on a list. You know, you can be, um, you know, a target uh, for the for the government, and you can, you know, you're like a person who's not dangerous because of who you are, right. uh, and I. Th- and and that for me, like seeing that and seeing the impact that that had on him, and it it was interesting because it didn't have that same impact on me. My last name isn't Fahuri, and I don't have dark skin, and so I I, I definitely walk in through the world as as white, and that's how people relate to me. So I I didn't experience it directly, but I saw it. I saw how it was impacting he and other and my other Arabic family members and. It's just like, wow, this is totally unjust. You said mm-hmm. how to find your people in an unjust world. This is completely unjust. And most people weren't aware, aren't, simply aren't aware of that. Yeah. Uh, they walk around just kind of with blinders on to these social issues and to their impact um, because, they don't, because they're not implicated directly. You know, it doesn't affect them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or um, someone they love really closely, you know. Or someone that they love really closely. Yeah. That's right. I think, yeah. Wow. I mean, thank you for sharing all that. I feel like. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry that happened, you know, and I, I, as you were talking, I was feeling both like what it would, must have been like for, for him, you know, to suddenly overnight become like public enemy number one and be looked at with suspicion and have to perform this, you know, safe person all the time, you know, which maybe right. he's like going around living his life and, you know, having kind of run a, run of the mill racism and not like, you know, right. the, right. not the like acute, like, you know, yeah. um, kind of, uh, um, assumption of like guilt and, you know, um, that, that started happening after that. But then also like, yeah, how it must've been for you. It sounds like to, um, you know, to love him, to have like in your bones, you know, this, you know, whatever gets passed, passed down to us about these experiences. And, you know, um, we know more about that than we used to, you know, in terms of how, how to yes. and pass on these, these experiences to one another. And then, um, and also not to have that be really visible to other people necessarily, unless you make it visible, you know? Yes. Um, yes. That, that sounds like that must've been hard. I, I, I really appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. And it's, um, and I guess it's true. Yeah. And th- I mean, this is so much of the reason I wanted to talk to, um, with you is it, it feels to me like there is this really like when, when, around the the topic of race in particular, um, there's this, <laughs> it's the only term I can think of is <laughs> the great, the gray zone, you know, it's like the space where, um, you know, for, for you as someone who's multiracial, you, you know, your dad was uh, an immigrant and your mom uh, was an American, yeah, white American. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you've got this multiracial background. I was really curious to talk about that because that that's shaped my experience so much around these topics in ways that I think it's very hard for most people to understand if they came up in a, you know, kind of a singular uh, racial or 
cultural or ethnic background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for for me personally, a, a big part of the reason I avoided and ignored this topic for so long, like I didn't look at it directly was because of my own reactivity around how I was perceived by white folks, uh, pr particularly white progressives, mm -hmm. um, my colleagues and um, you know, fellow classmates at Naropa and things like that in, in yeah. spiritual community. And I, I, you know, I'd hear them saying these things about white people and, you know, there's a lot of, I guess, a lot of self-hatred, frankly, in, in this, in this, in the, in the communities I've been part of and a lot of goodwill and a lot of good intentions. Uh, and I just, I just, I was just like, that doesn't completely apply to me. You know, like you don't see me and, you know, all this sort of personal reactivity, but a lot of it was because I didn't share that part of me. It wasn't, it wasn't foregrounded. It, it, it wasn't something I felt safe sharing. Yeah. And so there was this, oh, oh, this internalized racism. Oh, there it is. Like, I don't feel safe sharing this. I don't feel safe wanting to explore Islam, which is part of my, you know, my background. It's something I'm drawn to, but it doesn't feel safe to be, you know, to practice that in this culture. Like that's, yeah, it's, I, I can really appreciate, and I really, really, really appreciate what you say, you know, what you shared in Radical Friendship about about like how, how you're moving forward, seeing you're in, you know, you have both these privileged and in, and internally oppressed identities, both, you know, that you're walking through the world, holding the, the paradox of that. Um, like that's something I can really relate to also as a, as an ethnically white person, um, growing up in a multicultural environment. It's like, oh yeah, um, I, I'm both, like I am both the oppressor and the oppressed, like in terms of my sh my shared collective identities like i i share in both of those things yeah yeah um, i appreciate you saying that because it, to me it, it it opens up the possibility for a real conversation instead of just feeling like um like it's super clear you know Thank you. It, it, I'm glad it came out clear. It's been a muddy process, you know, and I, <laughs> I relate to a lot of what you're saying about, you know, um, having, um, starting to have language for what internalized oppression is and, mm -hmm. um, the, um, not wanting to deal with the experience of, you know, being mixed race, like really just not, not, I, I mean, it, it wasn't even, I feel like it, it could have come in more in this book and maybe it'll be more a part of future writing. Um, uh, it definitely was something that I didn't want to talk about. And there was an early draft of this book that I showed to a friend who uh, read it. And she's like, you know, I'm getting this feeling like you're trying to say a thing, but you're not really saying it. She's like, what are you saying? Like, what is it? What What's the story that you don't want to tell that you're trying to talk around? And I was like, mm. oh, I have to talk about being mixed. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know? Um, although when I looked back, it's, you know, just to be honest, like that, you know, so many of my early, um, you know, conversations and negotiations and attempts at friendship were really shaped by this, you know, approaching them from this multiracial, you know, identity and uh the complexities that came with negotiating friendship with that for me you know in chicago in the 80s you know? yeah you said as early as four years old you were really confronted with that yeah know, the reality yeah. Of, of of race and i remember you know i remember um and then um i think there was so much discomfort through my early years um in part because you know my parents, like, I think all parents try, you know, did the best they could. And also, um, were, I think didn't really know how to prepare me to be in the world with the, you know, the characteristics that I have. Um, hmm. and how could they, you know, they didn't. Right. Cause they didn't share, share, share. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose they could have read a book, but <laughs> like, <laughs> moving along, you know, like, they were, like I didn't even know if there was that much out there at that time, you know, like, um, yeah, but good point. I, I, I think one of the gifts of writing this book, um, that is just starting to open up for me is, um, one, just the real desire to be honest and to include as much as possible of like who I know I am and the, the sense of relief that I feel when I know I'm not hiding anything. 
Um, mm. And that like that, that makes space for me to really show up uh, for intimacy in relationships in a way that I can, if I'm constantly trying to manage how others are perceiving me or display mm. or perform certain aspects of my identity to, you know, please, uh, you know, uh, uh, whoever I'm with. Um, mm. And so um, I think that's been a gift. And then also, um, you know, I don't know what this means, but I know that what I see is that, that, you know, we're in a place now where there's m- more people who are from black indigenous and POC lineages teaching, um, certainly in my, my tradition and insight meditation tradition than ever had before, um, a good chunk of us are mixed race. Um, mm. and so I'm also not exactly sure what that means. Like, you know, uh, in terms of why it is we were drawn to the Dharma, um, uh, you know, mm-hmm. is this like, as you said, you know, with your experience with Islam and being drawn, but also feeling um, hesitant in some way, like does, does the Buddha Dharma somehow feel safer to us because it's, it's not, doesn't have to do with any, any of our identities right. that we choose. Uh, I'm yeah. curious about that. I'm curious about whether there's um, uh, a preference for, you know, BIPOC teachers with lighter skin. Um, mm-hmm. and that right. you know, I might've benefited from that. Like that, you know, there, there's, I, I'm, I most certainly benefited from that. Let's just say that. Um, yeah. so there's, there's all that. Because, and then, because it's less threat threatening yeah. racially. Is that, is that the kind of idea that I think so? I think so. I think it's less threatening. I think it's, um, that I feel, you know, for all of the discomfort that I expressed, you know, feeling in the conference or on the meditation retreat, um, I also feel fairly capable to manage that discomfort and show up in a way that doesn't make other people uncomfortable. <laughs> like, I feel like that's mm-hmm. one of my survival skills. Um, and so um, I think that, you know, for obvious reasons, like people who, who don't want to deal with um, issues around power and race prefer that. Um, and that's, that's been a, that's been an unlearning for me. I have to, I have to say it, you know, <laughs> that's not so much the case. Like I'm, I'm less and less, you, you talked about a little bit when you were talking about your grandfather about the costs of, um, assimilation. You know, I feel like less and less willing to, uh, to shoulder that cost. Um, so mm, I think more and right. more are, you know, disappointed if that's the role they want me to play in their, in their teaching team or in their organization. <laughs> but, um, but uh, I think w- another another gift of just this uh, this um, invitation to explore um, friendship through the lens of just the the identity and the experience that I've had as a mixed race person is like just the idea that there may be something worthwhile to be known from this identity that is worth mm. worth exploring and worth sharing. Um, mm. that rather than what I experienced for much of my life, which is, you know, how can I, um, let's see, how can I say this? How can I, um, like, create and manifest an identity that is singular, that is easy for me to be in and easy for other people to understand Hmm. Um, that actually maybe that complexity is um, not only okay, but has something uh, is a site from which there can be something of value that can be known about the world Hmm. and about, you know, Hmm. experience, um, especially given what we know about the, the, you know, what the Buddha taught about the self, that it is actually always complex and, Hmm. um, uh, multiplicitous is that a word, <laughs> you know, mm, but made, mm, made of all of these component parts. Right. And that, um, uh, you know, whether or not we, we feel that, you know, com- that's how, that's how he said it is. And so for those of us who do feel that on a, on a day to day moment to moment basis, like, is there something unique for us to share? You know? mm, 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 mm. I, what comes to mind, is um, the, the idea of being like a, a bridge um, or like bri- bridging perspectives. It seems like, you know, given your experience, you're in a unique position where you grew up 
your primary caregivers, you know, your, your parents, the people that we identify with the most when we're young children, like you had two different looking parents and you could, you know, to some degree you can, you can take the perspective and identify with this, like the white perspective and the, you know, it's not that simple. I know, but you know, you can, you can, you have a unique, I imagine a unique capacity to do that. Um, that, that a lot of people don't necessarily have, you know, there, there's this ability to take the perspective of one and take the perspective of the other mm-hmm. and see like, it's not, it's not all this way. It's not all that way. There's, there's this sort of this tremendous complexity and nuance. And there's things that people don't see uh, on all sides of the, of the issue. Yeah. Um, yeah anyway, yeah, totally, do you feel yeah, like yeah. you're a bridge? Um, yeah. Although I think what it means to be a bridge has evolved for me, you know, I think like, yeah, how so? back in the day when I was a kid, I, you know, I, I, as you were talking, I had this memory of like one day when I was with my, my mom and dad and my mom, you know, we we're talking, she was talking about safety and she was trying to teach me, you know, when something, you know, bad happens, you know, like the, like you call 911 and here's the phone and here's how you dial. And, you know, like you call the police and, you know, she kind of, mm. I was like, okay. And she walks to the room. My dad comes close to me and he goes, never call the police. <laughs> it was like, never under any circumstances call the police. And I was like, okay. So like there's wow. you know, I think part of the bridging, you know, for, you know, for obvious reasons, right. Like for, for him um, as a black man, like the yes. um, police uh, make him less safe most of the time. Um, right. And, uh, you know, I think so, you know, in my young life, I feel like the bridging was like me, you know, the, the feeling that I have is so visceral. It's like stretching to try to touch these really um, far apart realities and trying mm. to sense of them like through my experience, you know, um, yes. and the, you know, the real difficulty and kind of pain of that at times. Uh, and then, um, now I think, yeah, I like the idea of the bridge being something that, um, like maybe not, I am a bridge, but I have a bridge, you know, that like I can, um, travel back and forth. And I do find myself at times being in the role of like a translator or, um, yes. Yeah, like you were at the conference. Yeah, maybe <laughs> that, that to some degree. Problem. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally willing to, I'm, if that is my, that, I have wondered at times if like, is that my, is that my karma? Like, is that my right role in the revolution, <laughs> you know, is to be the kind of, um, you know, translator or, you know, um, hmm. and I, I know that it's not always easy for me and sometimes there mm. is like an energetic and emotional cost, but if, if it is, yes. it does seem to be a good role for me at times. And if that's like, if that is a right role, then um, I think I want to be, I want to be the best, the best, most honest, um, least uh, self-serving translator that I can be, you know? Mm. Um, mm. And uh and I know that that's, <laughs> you might be hearing my, my, my daughter and her um, babysitter background. <laughs> she thinks she got a yay because she, you know, successfully changed the diaper. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that, um, part of how, part of how teaching, part of how the Dharma, part of how like awakening seems to work, um, is that, there are some people for whom like each of us are going to be a, a healing presence and for wh- from whom people can hear things they might not be able to hear from other people. Right. And right. I experienced that, you know, I was just talking to um, a friend uh, and like fellow, you know, we work together from time to time, Carrie Kelly. And, you know, she um, is a white yoga lady who's like really um, kind of on the, you know, aligns herself with radical politics and um, I think has, has done an amazing job of like for her. Yeah. 
just knowing who her audience is and knowing that there are some people who are going to be able to hear, um, hear the truth from Kelly who aren't going to be able to hear it from me, for example. Right. And in, by the same turn, I think there are some people who are going to be able to hear it from me that aren't going to be able to heal it from somebody else. And so yeah, if I'm the one I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. You know, I know that that it's also, I guess why I'm, why I'm wavering is it strikes me that that's a tremendous amount of power and that I wouldn't want to do it wrong, mm, you know? Mm, um, mm, mm. But what I've been taught over and over again is like, um, to, you know, when I have, when I have power to center my highest intentions, my most honest, pure intentions Mm -hmm. and know that probably my intentions will be mixed and there'll be some other stuff in there too. And to, Mm -hmm. um, be continuously honest with myself and surround myself with good people who will Mm -hmm. um, let me know when I'm, when I'm, when I'm off path. Um, friends, good good friends, (laughs) friends. friends, you know? Yeah. Who, 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 like your friend who, 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 uh, pointed out there was something you weren't you're avoiding in your book yeah yeah and another yeah. friend who before i published it was like hey this this you know basically he was like kate it sounds like you wrote this book for um for white people you know like is that your intention and i was like oh mm. there it goes again you know like the you know mm. academic training that i had that was supposed to center a particular reader and um mm. Mm. You know, the training that i had to really just talk to that person over and over and um yeah, a friend who said like, you know, you can, you can, you can do this differently than, um, than you have been trained to do it. And what if you, what if you talk to the people who, um, you see as your community and people who are a lot like you?